Kingdom Innovation that are hosted by myself, John Hurst, and J.D. Payne. Uh, we're so glad that each of you is with us and we're able to spend this time together. The idea of these conversations is a very relaxed and uh, conversational approach to this discussion. We know this discussion can be very heavy and intense, and a lot of times you get a lot of data and information, but you don't get a lot of application. And so the idea behind these is very much uh, to create a different environment from uh, some of the other things you'll experience in typical webinars. And so uh, that's our desire. Um, as we're starting today, I want to remind you of your homework assignment that JD gave you kind of at the last part. There of will be a grade. There will be a grade. And JD is a professor. So, you know, <laughs> he, he's used to using that red pen. Um, but we had given you the assignment last time. And I'm sharing this with you because this might stoke some thoughts uh, when we get to the question and answer time in a little while. Uh, but we said, based on our discussion last time, how do you understand kingdom innovation and how would this understanding influence practical ministry for you? And the reason we ask that question is because as we segue into this discussion, um, we're, we're focusing on a very, very practical aspect of kingdom innovation. So JD, why don't you introduce our topic for this morning? Yeah, um, and it's really good to be back with you folks. If you're first timers, uh, welcome. And uh, if you were with us last month, then um, I want to just uh, give you a, a brief recap of where we were. So last month, um, if you remember, or if this is your first time, we talked about biblical foundations uh, for this topic of kingdom innovation. And we we really wanted to, to kind of begin these six uh, conversations by, by setting the biblical foundation and begin to talk about what are some of the parameters out there when we talk about this issue of, of innovation, because it is different than innovation in corporate business practices. However, there are things because of the nature of God's universe and the truths that he has built into uh, his universe that, uh, that there are some similarities. And so we just wanted to make certain from last month's conversation that that we were establishing a, a biblical perspective on which we build out the future conversations. So that moves us to today's topic. And so today's topic, we, we're, we're moving more from the theoretical into, into the practical. And so we're, we're talking about the issue of, of how to apply. So the application, how to apply uh, kingdom innovation in local contexts and sort of our subtitle uh, is uh, principles and guidelines. And so that's what we're going to be dealing with uh, in this session today. So we hope that uh, at the end of our time, um, uh, John and I will probably talk for 20, 25 minutes, something like that. And then we're going to throw it open to you uh, for any questions, comments, uh, feedback that you may have. So uh, that's where we'll be going today as we talk about this issue of how to apply kingdom innovation in uh, local context. So, uh, John, I'll pitch it back to you and uh, we'll kind of go from there. All right. All right. Well, you know, I think as we as we begin this uh, discussion, JD, you know, I think um, you know innovation can be a very intimidating subject because uh, whenever we think about having to do something new and innovative, we put this pressure on ourselves, right? We yeah. we say, "Oh my goodness, it's got to be really good," and and it's got to be different, and and if anyone's thought about it before, well, then it doesn't count anymore, and so we we kind of build up this pressure, mm -hmm. and and then and then of course under pressure, it's very hard to be creative, right? So. You know, I'm thinking about um, kind of just uh, having you frame up or, or getting your input on this idea of as we move innovation from being abstract, right, this right. big idea with these general principles to guidelines uh, that are very tangible on the ground that you could use tomorrow when you're in your team meeting, uh, let's say, in Pretoria, South Africa or in Java or in mm -hmm. Alabama, et cetera, you know, to say, what, what do we do today that would be different or new that would really begin to um, to allow us to think innovatively. Well, what are some of those guidelines that, that come up to you or that, that kind of uh, bubble to the top for you, J.D.? Yeah, you know, I think, John, one of the things that we, we have to make certain is that we really apply what, what Paul talks about when he talks about praying without ceasing, because what we're addressing is is something that needs to be an outflow, or maybe I should say an overflow of our dynamic walk with the Lord. And we talked about that um, last month, um, and then we'll probably talk about it uh, in the future because it's, it's a part of all of this process. But as you and your team begin to pray through this issue of, uh, of, of what, what's the most urgent factor? What's the most urgent matter that we're, we're dealing with? What, what would be the most important thing that we need to address 
right now or in the immediate future? Uh, what's the most critical thing that we need to do to move things forward? Those are some things that I think are, are, are first and foremost on our mind. So um, for those of you that are kind of linear thinkers, I'm, I'll just quickly give you sort of a, a very brief list and um, of, of several things that I process and think through. And I'm going to slow down on one of them uh, that uh, is actually sort of a sub list within uh, this larger list. Um, but here's some of the guidelines that I think about. So praying without, you know, praying without ceasing, thinking about what's the most critical issues. Um, what we talked about last month, the issue of making certain that we're grounded in the scriptures when we move forward as we do as leaders, because we've got to make certain that we're, we're leading uh, like Christ would have us to lead uh, in making changes and making plans and things of that nature. Um, we've got to uh, become all things without compromise. And so, you know, how do you how do you become all things to all people so that we might win some? But at the same time, we've got to recognize that this issue of, of pragmatism, that philosophy that we talked about last month, is 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 something that creeps in. And so, we've got to be careful in making certain that we we seek to become all things for the sake of God's glory among the nations. But we've got to do so without compromise. Another thing that I think about is that we have to be people that not only anticipate change, but we've got to prepare our teams for anticipating change, uh, which that means that we have to learn how to develop our teams. And I think that's a topic for, for a future uh, discussion that we'll be having. But um, some of the other things I think about is that we have to foster an environment of grace. We've got to let people uh, fail, if we can use that term, and make mistakes. Um, we've got to think about how to embrace the urgent and, and discern, okay, what's, what's, again, what I said earlier, what's most important, uh, what's secondary, what's tertiary, and make certain that we're, we're giving our, our attention to the priorities. We've got to learn with humility. We've got to see the value of culture and engaging culture. Uh, we've got to be strategic thinkers. That, that's one of the big things that I see lacking in a lot of organizations and in a lot of churches today, uh, among pastoral leadership in particular, but also among um, missionaries as well. And that is, there are a lot of people out there that they're just not thinking strategically. They're not thinking about how do they move from point A to, to point B and what are the steps in that process. You so know, that's kind of my big list, but I wanted to give you what I call the big five. Yeah. yeah. And so, so here's something that I think if I could summarize it all together, that's most helpful to this process of thinking about guidelines for innovation is what I call the big five. And that is, this notion of innovation and making application to our local context revolves around some very simple things. Number one, we ask good questions. We, we've got to become people who learn how to ask the right questions and those questions need to be good questions. We respond, number two, we respond with healthy answers. So we're asking good questions, we're responding with healthy answers to the, to the circumstance, the challenges that's there. And then we've got to think about number three, how do we apply wise action steps to what we're doing. So we're asking good questions about our circumstance, our local context. We're coming up with good answers and we're thinking about, okay, so what are some wise action steps that we need to apply? And then number four, we need to aggressively evaluate. Uh, it's a it's a kingdom stewardship matter that we talked about last month. So how do we aggressively evaluate everything? And then number five, we pray with all diligence. So that's what I call the big five. So ask good questions, respond with healthy answers apply wise action steps, evaluate everything and, and pray with diligence. Yeah. You know, one thing that comes to my mind, JD, I don't, as we're thinking about this, you know, I, I, I was recently in Penang, Malaysia, meeting with some different ministry teams and, uh -huh. and just reminded again of, you know, in the, in the daily life of someone who's on a ministry team somewhere in the world doing ministry, you know, they've got a lot of things going on, right? They've got language learning going on. They've got some maybe operational responsibilities. They've got some training that's going on. So it's a very diverse and varied kind of workload, right? Mm -hmm. And and right. that diverse and varied workload means that it's hard to focus, right? And the kind of things that we're talking about here, being strategic in that, it really takes some focus. Um, mm -hmm. What are some thoughts you have on maybe how do we help um, our team members to focus in, to see the opportunities for innovation? Yeah, I, th I think part of it, now this is my linear Western thinking that's coming out. So again, applying in your local context, you need to process this in your worldview and the team that you're working with. For me, it is it oftentimes means showing lists, developing lists, putting lists up on maybe a whiteboard on a screen or something of that nature, and begin to, to prayerfully consider, 
you, you know, here are a lot of things that we could be doing. Some of these are, are good things, but what are the best things that we need to be focusing on? And yeah. so helping people see big picture, seeing that there are a lot of things that, again, maybe my teammates, someone's got different passions and interests than I do. Uh, they may think something is needs to be a higher priority than maybe I think about it. And so as a team leader, I have to help the team work through some of those things. But for me, a lot of it has to do with LISP. Yeah. Um, but I do want to pitch a question to you, John, because it deals with this issue of local context. And and I know that you and I, you know, we've talked, uh, you know, off camera, of course, about this issue of of um, the issue of context and things of that nature. Now, you, I know you kind of struggle with with the word context. So so could you describe maybe, um, you know, the why, the challenge uh, that you wrestle with when you when you think about that word? Sure, sure. You know, yeah, it's one of these things where um, it's a love-hate relationship I have with this word context. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's like you know, at, at one level, I believe we live in the age of context, meaning yeah. we've, we gone from this, we've gone from this globalized reality in modernity to this hyper-local reality that's informed by the global. But yeah. what's happened, though, and, and what I think the danger is, especially when it comes to disciplines like innovation, is that we very, very quickly and easily, sometimes because it's convenient for us, sometimes because we're just trying to manage our, the intake of information, we go, hey, this is my local context. What you've just said really can't apply, mm. right? It's too different. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, you know, one of the things that I always um, giggle at when, when I talk to different ministries, and some of the people on this call might be able to relate. In fact, they might have said this to me. Uh, and so if you have, uh, know that I've been laughing on the inside. But, but um, this idea of, our ministry is so different that it doesn't, no one else could understand how we work, right? Mm -hmm. You hear this a lot, and, and I think it relates to the same idea of context, because um, when, we're, when we're in a local setting, we, we begin to get this idea, wow, this is so, you know, we're immersed in it, we're trying to understand the uniquenesses and the diversities of it, we're going, man, this is so different than anywhere else I've ever worked. No, mm -hmm. nothing else could apply. Mm -hmm. And I think the danger we fall into is that there are some universal truths that are true everywhere and then there's some local truths that are true locally yeah and god actually allows those things to come together in a dynamic way you know i think about the story of daniel um daniel was plucked out of his local context in israel right mm -hmm. dumped into this very different setting in babylon right um there were still some universal things that were true he had a reason why he didn't eat the meat, right? There were some moral reasons. He had reasons why he pointed a certain way to pray three times a day, right? There were reasons for those things. But we don't hear about the millions of little things he had to do locally to make it work, mm -hmm. right? He had to innovate in a dozen ways to be a good leader in Babylon and also be a follower of God from Israel, right? Mm -hmm. And, and so, and so, I, I guess what I'm what I'm trying to look for is this is more of a balanced approach. Yeah. To say my local context is definitely unique and different, but it doesn't mean I can't learn. Right. Um. And and my first response should not be that doesn't apply because of my local context. Right. Does that yeah. make sense? It it does. You know. And, and as you talk, you know, I'm, you know, I often think in terms of metaphors and analogies and things of that nature. And so I, I'm kind of thinking like the whole uh, panning for gold kind of concept mm -hmm. where, whereas a gold sifter, you know, you're, you're, you're scooping up sediment from a riverbed and you're, you know, you're shaking it and you're letting the, the, the current wash off the sediment and you're panning for those, those golden nuggets. And, and I wonder, you know, for me, it's helpful to kind of think about that in terms of, okay, I may be in a different context from, you know, this other sister, this other brother, but I, I don't need to rule them out by discrediting the fact that I'm in a different context, but what are those golden nuggets that I can take away from in their practices and in their pr approaches that I can apply in my context? I mean, am I on the right track there? Yeah, you know, I think I think that's a really good way to put it, JD. So almost like, you know, our typical answer in the ministry world right now is, but my local context doesn't make that applicable. Yeah, yeah, I hear that um, all the time. But if, if we just change our answer just a little bit or our response just a little bit to say, but my local context is unique. However, mm. I see these two or three things in what you just said that I think I could apply. Yeah, I like that word, however. That's a good one. Yeah. And and I think what that does is that allows us to, to bring in innovative ideas into our setting, 
but also not throw out the fact that we're in a unique setting, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Because both are true. That's right. And we have to live with the, those two realities both being true. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Yep. And, you, and you, even to think about your team, I mean, you think about your own strengths, passions, gifts, interests that differ from someone else. So, yeah. That's, yeah, it's, that's good. But, and, and, and I think what, what will show, um, and I think what will allow um, outside ideas to flow in and will allow the level of critical thinking in our teams to rise is that um, uh, assessing the local context, but also assessing the global value, right? Um, yeah. In different ideas and concepts. So yeah, so yeah you know, I was just on a conversation this morning where we were talking about local context and, and wrestling with this very thing. So I think it, in our world, in the ministry world, I think it happens every day. So it's mm -hmm. very, very, very normal. Yeah. Let me go to another question for you, JD. Um, when you think about localizing innovation, um, do you see any examples in scripture or any biblical insights that just kind of uh, really jump out at you that you think are appropriate as we really marry kingdom and innovation in, in an integrated way? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, the one that immediately comes to my mind, uh, for example, in the book of Acts is actually in chapter six. And, um, you know, the, the gospel is spreading throughout Jerusalem. The disciples are multiplying. You know, they're, they're, they're devoting themselves to the apostles, teaching, breaking bread, prayers, things of that nature. And, and you see all this exciting thing, all these exciting things happen from Acts chapter one to, to Acts chapter to five. And then all of a sudden, at the beginning of Acts chapter six, you get this internal conflict. Mm -hmm. And so there's that challenge that the the disciples are faced with the leadership team they're faced with that challenge and what is that challenge it's you know, it's, it's over the that food distribution so you've got the uh, the hebrew widows you've got the greek uh, speaking widows and uh, there's this this debate over one party being neglected and so the apostles are called in to address this issue and uh, they begin to to be a part of this and what happens you know, from the text there is that the ministry of the apostles preaching and prayer uh, become neglected and so it's not like the 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 apostles say hey this is this is a, a bad thing um you know the, you know, forget about this we need to get back to preaching and prayer they recognize that it's a it's a significant need a significant challenge and it's affecting the body and it, it basically when, when you begin to look like for example you know in the text here it, you know, they basically summon the people together and they uh, tell them, you know, hey, pick out from you uh, seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint uh, to this duty. And so, so they do. They they select these seven. Uh, they begin to to serve these widows. And then, what you see at the end of that passage there in verse seven is the word continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And the fascinating thing is, is that some of the most resistant now begin to come to faith and that is um, a great number of the priests become obedient to the faith so so you see this challenge is conflict they deal with this issue internally they recognize some prioritization but here's the thing they they have to change they have to adjust their structure they have to to make shifts and they're not going to look the same on the other side of acts chapter six verses one through seven you know one thing that comes to my mind as you share about uh, that particular biblical story is the fact that um, if the disciples, if the apostles had not um, essentially had to innovate and change their roles and modify the structure to support the needs, leaders like Stephen would have never bubbled up necessarily, mm. right? Mm. That's a um, good point. You know, it's like this, it's amazing how this responsiveness by the apostles then made it possible for whole new sets of leaders to um take the role that they're actually very gifted to do, right? Yeah, you even see you even see Philip in this in this list as well. That's, I, right. I, that's a great point because you know innovation is that opportunity, isn't it, to to develop leaders and raise up leaders. Um seeing it seeing the glass, you know, half full, even in a challenging time, uh, yeah. is, is a good way to look at it. You know, th this brings up something, JD, that you actually mentioned earlier. I'd love um I love your thoughts on it is um is you know innovation in this um process of ambiguity and resolution and strategic thinking is a great opportunity for us to actually um, train our teams, to give lifelong learning opportunities to our teams in the field. So we're sitting in a staff meeting, you know, we've got, let's say, a big event coming up, a pastoral training, or we're doing an outreach in a certain town or whatever we might be doing. And, 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 um, and, and to have an innovation discussion actually is a learning opportunity. But 
But, but what are ways that we can actually make it learning rather than just say, telling people, hey, we're going to do this thing? You know, any thoughts on, on how to actually make it an opportunity for growth and learning as well as actually accomplishing something new? Yeah, I, I think when we invite them into that process of, if you remember going back to the kind of the big, the big five, invite mm -hmm. them into that process of what are the good questions? Yeah. Um, you know, what, what going back to, to my way of thinking, you know, what are the lists that, that we need to look at? Um, so that people feel like they on your team, they feel like they're they're contributing uh, mm. to the process. And it's in that contribution to the process that, that they grow, they develop, they see your heart as a leader, your humility. Uh, and and they can they have that ownership. And it's not just something that is that is mandated to them, but it's something that allows them to to participate. And, and, I, and to me, that's just what body life looks like, whether it's on a small team or whether that's in a local church. Yeah, no, that's, that's good. I think that inviting in and, and in that inviting in, I think we can model what it looks like to ask a good question, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, cause, cause we're going to be asking those hopefully as leaders, right? We're going to be saying, Hey, so, you know, what might be another way to do, you know, our objective is a, mm -hmm. but what's maybe, what's maybe a new way to get to a, that maybe yeah. we haven't thought of before or, or we, or this, you know, the one that comes to my mind that so often happens is, is you're you're on a track, right? You've got a project, you've got a an event you're holding, you've got a, a an opportunity, and you're on the way to developing it, and all of a sudden there's a new character, a new person who enters the scene of the ministry opportunity. Mm -hmm. Maybe someone in the local church rises up and says, "Can I be involved?" Right? Yeah. Or yeah. Maybe there's a local leader in that town who, who um, who you get a chance to have coffee with, or you know, whatever the case might be. And in that setting, all of a sudden, the dynamics have changed. Mm -hmm. You know, that's in, right. in, in, almost in my mind, that that's an opportunity for the leader to go, "Hey, guys, the dynamics have changed. This leader wasn't on the scene before. They they weren't giving us the time of day before. Yeah. Now they've had coffee with me, and they've said, "Hey, whatever I can do to make this event more successful." Yeah, and, and it gives you that outsider's perspective. I mean, you know, part of the big five is, uh, you know, aggressive evaluation. And so mm. having that, having those people participate and evaluate, um, you know, as you're talking, it's something I, I remember I used to do with with church members. Um, you know, we we had been a member you know, of the church for for a long time. And so a after a while, we we begin to not look and think about what it means to come into our building on our property and our worship gatherings through the eyes of like a guest. And so um, I would take church members, leadership team actually, and we would drive off of the property. And then I would say, Hey, let's approach our property through the eyes of someone who's never been here before. Yeah. And, and let's look and see what, what would they see? What would they feel? What would they sense? And so again, that new perspective, uh, having a new person on your team, bringing someone in, that can be that can be most helpful in the process. Yeah, and that hits on the whole idea of empathy, right? And the idea right. of uh, seeing the world through someone else's eyes. We, I remember we did an activity when I uh, when I led the communications team at um, HCJB Global, and uh -huh. now it's called Reach Beyond. And we we actually, um, you know, we would send out letters to the donors, right? We'd send a letter and explaining what was going on in the ministry, asking them to be involved. And so I actually had our whole team photograph every step that a letter takes from their own mailbox to where it ends up. Right. Oh, yeah. And then we looked at all the photographs and it led to some very innovative and kind of reframing kind of thinking because all of a sudden these people that, you know, did the design or the writing or the logistics for a letter. Now we're looking at that letter from a whole new perspective. Right. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, John, here's a question uh, I'll throw throw back to you. Um, how does innovation uh, help you to better respond to to opportunities for ministry in your local community? Yeah, you know, I, I think that um that at the base of that question, in my mind, is this word respond. Um, you know, it, it's one thing if you have a program and you run a program, right? you're a manager or a runner of something. Mm -hmm. And and in a lot of cases, when we get in that mode, we just run it, uh, no matter what's going on around us. Um, but the idea of being responsive is this idea that you are, you are looking at what's going on as you run it, and you are saying, what am I seeing, right? I think that innovation brings in a flexibility mm. that is 
fundamentally not part of our DNA when it comes to the manager mode, right? When we're in manager mode, we're talking about efficiency, we're talking about effectiveness, mm -hmm. we're talking about reducing man hours or women hours, or, you know, we're, we're, we're focused on that kind of activity. Right. Um, but what that means is we're not focused on actually how it's going, right? Is it effective, right? Mm -hmm. you know, but when we're responsible and we're saying, hey, you know, I, I just did the reconnaissance trip for this upcoming event, and I noticed that here's actually how people get around town. They don't get around town the way I thought they did. They mm -hmm. actually get around town in this way, which means that at this time of day when we do the event, that's going to have some implications on who shows up, Yeah. right? So maybe we need an innovative approach to transportation for the event, right? And so I think when you think in that really responsive way, um, it puts you in a flexible environment which says, hey, I'm willing to take in new input mm -hmm. and change the plan to have it represent effective reality in the moment rather than just what I had planned months ahead. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, I think that that, I mean, that that is so important to keep in mind because there, there's a tension as leaders uh, whereby we, we have to walk between the, the, the stability and, and the, and the progress. And, and it's those two areas overlap at that point of flexibility uh, that you were, that word that you were yeah. using. And, and a lot of leaders, I think gravitate in one direction or the other. Mm -hmm. And the ones that are more focused on that managerial mode, they have a really hard time leading for leading through change and and development for kingdom expansion. On the other hand, those that are very much on that more pioneering, innovative side of progress, um, they they often do a lot of damage to the people on their team, people in their organization, people in their churches because they're shaking things up so much, so frequently uh, that they're disrupting. Uh, structures that the spirit has used to sanctify the people, sanctify the body. And, yeah. um, and so yeah, the, the, the wise leader learns how that's to strike, you know, you know, in, in that zone where that flexibility point comes about. You know, um, I, I was just doing some research for a, for a Luzon presentation I did for the global work summit that's going on right now. And I was doing it on, on these roles, exactly what you're talking about, JD. And one of the models that I found really, really helpful, was this idea of the fortress builder and the ship navigator. Um, yeah. and, and essentially yeah. what, what they were saying in this little model, and it's oversimplified, of course, but it's helpful. I think. Mm -hmm. Some people on your team are fortress builders, mm -hmm. meaning they take the, 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 um, the land that's been won or the progress that's been made and they protect it, they make it more efficient, they make it more effective, right? Right. Some people on your team are the ship navigators. They're being sent out from that little fortress out into the seas to look for new things, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And uh, a good leader is able to see who on their team is a fortress builder and maintainer and who on their team is a ship navigator and balance those people out and empower both, right? Mm -hmm. Not say one is better than the other because neither one is better than the other. They're both needed but also not minimize one or the other um, and and devalue their contribution either. Yeah, that's good. Well, hey, uh, should we open it up for some some questions? Let's do it, let's do it. Let me let me start, JD, I'm gonna share. Um, we've got um, our friend Dana has, uh, has, has mentioned several things, so let me read those. And everyone else on the call, we're gonna switch over to maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes of questions, depending on how much you guys have to say. So uh, feel free to type those into the chat box at the bottom right. And I'm going to start with Dana's comments. So, J.D., let me read those to you. Okay. And, and, we'll and I can't see the comments, John, so I just want to give you a heads up. Okay. One of the key issues you have raised is becoming like, which has a number of incarnational aspects, but in design thinking that this is captured by the concept of empathy, which we just talked about for a minute, with a customer base or ministry segment, to think strategically about creating large movements to Christ, we need to get out into the community to ask good questions with empathy about felt needs, hindrances to the gospel and locally natural processes that fit in with disciple making. And I'll just keep reading here. A practical way a team can do this is to have a few key questions that are put before a team per month or quarter with ongoing discussion about those questions. Like, 
How do locals meet together to solve a problem? What does kindness look like in this neighborhood? Mm. What are people afraid of? Ethnographic researchers do this on a weekly basis. Real world teams usually paste this monthly or quarterly. The innovation usually grows out of the empathetic connection uh, between local answers to live and Jesus's answers to life. I like that local answers to live and Jesus's answers to life. Yeah. So here's the question. How do you help leaders preserve the core and innovate the change in terms of shaping a team and a team culture? What are your thoughts there? Well, is, is Dana, is that right? Dana, yeah. Great, great, great feedback, comments. Uh, yeah. Dana, appreciate that. Uh, give, gave me some good things to, to chew on and think about. Um, I would say that you as a leader, you as a team need to have your um, non-negotiables. In other words, um, what 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 are what are the theological, missiological, what are the philosophical uh, principles out of which you operate? What what are the what's the gift mix that you have? What are your core values, uh, if we can use that that language, and and recognize that there are some things that you and your team and how you're wired, how the Lord has brought you together, you you, you cannot compromise on, um, and and so. That, that is sort of the foundational aspect for me. And then recognizing there are some things in culture and in context uh, that we, we just have to, we have to adjust and morph ourselves to in order to be effective. And it does mean asking some of those good qualitative questions. Um, how are people, how do people process? How do they think? How do, you know, what does, you know, what does shame look like? How do they make decisions in this context? And so, so that needs to be filtered through you and your team's uh, grid work in order to effectively connect with the people on the field. Yeah. You know, and another thought, JD, that comes to my mind related to this is going back to your idea of, uh, of change versus stability. Mm -hmm. I think that mix is so critical for a leader to manage. And it is so hard to manage because is, typically yeah. leaders are wired one way or the other. Either yeah. they're either the, the stability kind of leader or the change kind of leader. It's mm -hmm. not typical to have one that's, you know, even one and the other. Right. That's and so right. whatever your personal preference is, is kind of how you end up, you know, focusing your leadership. But, but related to this, I think one of the things that's really, really helpful is in an environment where you're trying to instigate innovation is to have solid and stable innovation processes um, where you go through the same kind of um, set of things. So, mm, so when you're good. in a in a moment of innovation, it's not like the team's going, "Oh my goodness, what's going to come next?" Right. right. You say, "Hey, let's think a little differently about this, and we're going to use our little our little template that we've developed mm -hmm. as a team for how we're going to do that." Right. We're going to oh. ask these three questions. You know, and and so it brings some stability. And what what I found that it does is it actually frees the mind from the anxiety of the unknown yeah focus on the creativity so if i know because my team has decided already how we do this little innovation process right we ask these three questions and we have a discussion right mm -hmm. let's just say that's what it is if i know that's what's going to happen then i set aside the worry about what what's he going to ask next or what's she going to ask next yeah and i go okay i know the drill and so then my brain is freed up to just be creative, right? And think about mm -hmm. it, right? So there's almost like a little predictability in the unpredictability. And I, right? and I like that because we, all of us, no matter how progressive we are, we, we have to have stability and process. Mm -hmm. And so when, I, I really like that, John. It's great because it, it creates a, a methodology that, that allows for that flexibility and that progress and innovation. Yeah. Well, let's ask, let's ask the next question here Gre from Greg. What are some examples of universal truths versus local truths? How do they intersect from a practical standpoint? If you have multiple local contexts, do you segment to pull in all local issues or boil them down and lose context? Wow, that's a great question, Greg. And I think you and I were talking a little bit about that yesterday, John. <laughs> we were, we were. Um, you know, so I, I think... Um, I'll just start out and then I'll pitch it over to you, JD. So this <laughs> kind of... I was hoping you would keep that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Go, go for it. Since it's related to, to my pet peeve with the word context. But um, yeah. um, I, I think that um, that what you have to do here, it goes back to something that, that I've actually written a book on with my wife, Mindy, on Dr. Hebert's epistemological framework 
of critical realism where or, um, where essentially what he says is that there's truth you know and truth you're learning. Um, um, this idea that there are universal truths that we can depend upon and we can stand upon as Christians. And there's a lot of truth that we're learning together. I think what 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 the main thing that we have to do in order to take advantage of that dichotomy and that dynamic is to claim and state the truth we know. In in because mm -hmm. Dr. Hebert calls it a hermeneutical community, right? Mm -hmm. We as a team, as a ministry team, we are discovering truth together. That's really what's going on. So, like you were saying, JD, about having some of those non-negotiables and some of those you know, moral and missiological ethical frameworks, we kind of as a team have to say, yeah, we believe these things, maybe about contextualization, maybe about, you know, how we do ministry on the ground, how we involve uh, our local partners, you know, whatever the case might be. And then we have all these other areas where we say, you know, we're really learning in these areas. We don't really know exactly, mm -hmm. you know, how God wants us to do it. Those are the areas for innovation, right? Yeah. Because as we learn it, we come up with solutions, right? And so in my mind, it's this process of going, here's the truth we know, Here's the truth we're learning, kind of naming it and claiming it to reframe that that uh, that lingo that we use in other contexts. But um, to say this is what we know, this is what we're learning now. In the areas that we're learning, how do we innovate and know more? Because yeah. what we think is true is that as we know it together, it becomes the truth we know, right? Yeah. Because God reveals His truth to us through His Word, through our ministry, through our friends, through our ministry partners, etc. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, he's. Well said, brother. Um, this notion of you know you and your team, uh, if I can use this language, being the outsiders, you have you know the insiders, people from that context. Um, you have the word and the spirit as as those three parties you know come together. Word and spirit, you know my team, people on the field that come out of that environment. As we enter into dialogue and conversation together, you know we we make that progress. We move forward, but but it, it, that doesn't mean that things become, uh, you know, everything's relative. It doesn't lead to a postmodern hermeneutic or something like that, but it, it does mean that that there is an element of, of discerning uh, as we as we go forward. But we, you're right, we do have to begin, kind of going back to what we said, you know, last month, you know, what are the biblical foundations that we have to work from? And I think one of the other things that happens is that things we think we know, sometimes we don't really know. That's true. That's true. And we're all, we're all learning. We're all growing uh, in this journey together. It's, it's called sanctification. That's right. That's right. So, so we may say as a team, we know this to be true. A year into our work in a certain context, we may go, oh man, we thought we knew that. Mm -hmm. But we realize there's some dynamics to that issue yeah. that we but, just have no idea. But, right? but I, I would also say going back to that local universal, as you know, that's the beauty of the body of Christ across the world. As we begin to enter into enter into dialogue with brothers and sisters that are outside of our context if we're coming up with 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 ideas and thoughts that are radically different than what the body of christ across the world is saying and even what she has said throughout two thousand years of church history we, we probably need to stop and ask are, are we are we really moving in the right direction um and are we are we saying that our context is unique therefore we need to move in this direction um, maybe we need to stop and think about that because maybe we're not going in a healthy direction. You know, and, and this hits on an issue, JD, that I think we talked about last last time, but it's good to just refresh or, or just bring back in is, is that change is not sanctified in and of itself. You know, we mm -hmm. talked about how the world sees change as required just to survive, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning that you would change or die, right? That idea, right? Right, right. But, but in in scripture, we don't see anywhere where, where God says that, change in itself is holy or good just mm -hmm. for change's sake. Mm -hmm. Change is good if we are being transformed into the likeness of Christ, right? right? Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of change in the world, just like you're saying. We may come up with an innovative method for something that's just a bad idea, right? Okay. And, and we have to be open to the fact that just because it's new and innovative doesn't mean it's from God or that God wants us to do it. And as we get feedback from, to our ideas from the local body, from our teammates, from people within our organizations, we may realize, man, I thought that was a good idea, but it really wasn't. And we have to be brave enough to say, you know what? This innovative idea that I thought was really going to move us towards what God wanted us to do just wasn't, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So now Joe has a question. He says, um, what are your suggestions for the underground worker, 
that is seeking to advance the gospel in closed nations. That is nations that are hostile to Christianity. What are innovation dynamics there? Any any thoughts on that, JD? Well, I mean, I think again, Joe, I, I would say that much of what we're talking about filter it through your context of where there's very little, you know, presence of the body uh, or few to no known believers, and begin to to think about this process of of those big five questions, those concepts of of you know asking good questions about your environment, about you know to, to use your expression underground type work. Um, you know, what are the good questions you need to be asking? What are, the, what are the good questions your team needs to be asking? You know, what are the what are the healthy answers that you need to come up with? And um, what are the wise action steps? And, and wise is the key word there because some of the things that someone could do, you know, here in Birmingham or in you know in, in Colorado, uh, you can't do in your context. But but what is wise for you? is going to be very unique and very critical to the work of what you're doing. And then obviously uh, constantly evaluating and you know praying with diligence in that process. So I don't see a great deal of, of difference in, in the concepts that, you know, the guidelines principles we're talking about, but how they apply in your context is definitely going to be, be different than for most of us. John, what, what are your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, what comes to my mind in that one is, is the biggest difference is that I think the underground worker and the worker that has a lot of constraints around them, uh, whether they be constraints from a government or constraints from a society or a religion, whatever those constraints might look like, uh, those constraints can be isolating, right? Think about the fact that when you're constrained by, you know, maybe what you can share or who you can meet with or when you go out, you know, those kinds of dynamics. What that ends up happening is you end up getting isolated and most people in isolated environments struggle to be creative and come up with new ideas just because they don't have the inputs right so i think one of the things that i would say is key for an underground worker who may have various constraints on their ability to do the things that most of us in in open and free societies would just find very normal and natural is to find alternative ways to accomplish the same thing Mm -hmm. So, for instance, if you're an underground worker with Internet access, right, you know, obviously that's not everybody. Um, um, but um, and if there's not concerns about who's listening to your Internet or that sort of thing, you know, if you have freedom there, mm -hmm. you know, listening to uh, podcasts or webinars like, this, you know, getting outside input that doesn't require you to talk to anyone outside of your home. Right. Um, or maybe trips out of your um, restricted access area where you get to, you know, brainstorm with a larger team or even personal disciplines of, because, you know, not everyone is a, is a um, verbal processor like I am. You know, I think one of the reasons I like this format, JD, with you is because I, I think best uh, with other people. Well, not everyone's like that. Some people working in a um, constrained environment might be very much single processors where they can go on their journal and, you know, just journal and process that way. Right. right yeah. I think it's knowing yourself and saying, how do I process and how do I think creatively and what are some alternative ways that I might do that if mm -hmm. I have restrictions that are that are keeping me from doing the typical things that, you know, every um, business book would tell you to do. Right. Yeah. And, and, and Joe, I think that also part of it is and again, this depends on obviously where you are the scale by which you uh, come up with your your action steps and the plans, the scale may be reduced uh, instead of saying, hey, over the next 12 months, uh, myself and you know this other teammate or three people on our team or whatever, um, instead of thinking about how we can go from, you know, reaching you know 20 people with the gospel in the next 12 months, it may be we're going to spend the next six months just figuring out how to connect with the people and, and move from just casual conversation to actual gospel presentation. And it may be that by the end of year one, our goal is to maybe see two people come to faith in Christ. In other words, the, the scale may have to be pulled back. And, and one of the things that I often see um, with with folks on the field uh, and also in established church ministries is is we have we 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 too we compare ourselves too much with other people, and so we feel like we're not measuring up, we're not successful enough if we're not seeing the results. Um, and, and I would say, be careful that you don't do that, uh, particularly in your context. Okay. Well, that, that's, that's wise advice. I think scale 
it, when you have restrictions around you, scale is impacted. Mm -hmm. um, and we just have to recognize that. And obviously, God can do whatever he wants to do. Absolutely. And he can blow the doors out of that scale. But yeah. we have to start from some of the realities that are around us. Right. Certainly. Just to manage our own capacity. Let's go to the next question from Frank. He says, for the two of us, so he's asking us more maybe our personal thoughts on this. Uh, thinking back to some of your best thoughts or ideas, are there certain settings, times of day, things you're doing, et cetera, when they arise? Um, so essentially, it's the kind of the the setting for when innovation occurs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I'll 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 start that one out in 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 just uh, re re reiterating something I just said. What I've noticed about innovation is there are some people that innovate alone and then engage together. Yeah. And there are some people that verbally process. So I'll just give my example. I am a person. I've realized this about myself that I'm a verbal processor. So I can have a ton of inputs. Like, so I'll journal in the morning or I'll have my devotions or I'll read a book or whatever. And, and it'll be great. I'll, 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 I'll get a lot of insights, um, but they don't come together into creativity till I'm with someone else. Yeah. And so what I've had to do is I've had to um, make sure I have enough inputs coming in, reading articles, you know, journaling, processing, praying. But if I don't schedule those regular structured times with other people mm -hmm. for the sparks to fly, yeah. none of it actually produces any innovation for me. Yeah. What about you? Yeah. Um, so, so for me, it's, it's kind of a hodgepodge. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you there, John. I mean, I, I, some, I've seen the Lord do some really great things, come up with some, you know, our teams be able to come up with some great ideas when we're working together where we get away. Um, we just kind of lock ourselves in a room to, to pray and seek the Lord's face and, you know, process, brainstorm, get a whiteboard, write things down. Um, however, um, I, I, I border on that extrovert introvert line. And so I, I find most of my charging comes from being alone. And so often I feel like a lot of the creative juices begin to flow and you know with me um whenever i am reading books that are not related to ministry uh they're not related to missions uh when i am um when i'm you know dabbling into my hobbies and looking at people who are you know incredible musicians i used to i used to play you know guitar in a band and so you know when i'm reading articles about musicians and what they're doing and I'm reading things about art, things of that nature. Um, that's been helpful to me. Um, so kind of getting me outside of that, that ministry bubble. Mm -hmm. And then, and then also, um, some, I've had some incredible ideas. At least I've found them to be incredible. <laughs> Someone else may not think, think so much, um, come to me whenever I'm, I'm in the shower. So I don't know what it is about the shower. I don't know if it's like the product that I'm putting on my hair, you know, it just gets in, you know, whatever. But, um, yeah. So that's that's kind of my kind of my process. It's a hodgepodge. It's not um, it's not for everyone. You know, one of the things that I found about creativity. Uh, last thing I'll say, and then and then we can wrap up. I think JD, um, um, because we gotta um, honor people's time today. Um, but um, I think one of the things that I found is that one of the key disciplines um, and practices that seems pretty critical for innovation is that um, we, we have busy lives and schedules. And a lot, like you said, a lot of our aha moments come when we get out of our, our setting where we're just too immersed in the problem or the issue or the challenge or the setting, right? Mm -hmm. And so it could be we're reading something just on the internet or we're talking to someone at church. The documentation of aha moments. Yes. Um, for discussion later, it is I found is absolutely key. I've got with me, I've got a note notes on my iPhone, and I'll be taking notes all the time. You know, yeah. Here's here's He's my got his, yeah. and, <laughs> That's one of them. <laughs> and and I think that you need that tidbits. Like let's just take your iPhone for instance, your phone, hmm. your, your notes app, and your phone. You need that tidbits document where you're every time you have a random thought that might lead to some cool creative new approach you document it because what we know about ourselves especially as we get older is we lose the ability to simply recall that later out of sheer will right um, what you say just, just, I know, I know. 
You already forgot. That's right. <laughs> but I That's think it's really true. important. It's very true. You're exactly right. Is very much so. Yeah. And so, so just getting that, um, that discipline, you know, and that's one of the ideas um, um, my wife Mindy and I came up when we came up with the idea of generous mind was mm -hmm. was to be a generous mind is really a discipline of of being able to do certain things. And one of them is documenting what you're thinking about yeah, so that you can recall it later. Right. Um, becomes a pretty important uh, dynamic. Well, well, Frank has said uh, he's now going to be uh, buying more shampoo, J.D. So. <laughs> And now you, you'll have to reveal your your brand of shampoo because that might uh, influence some people's choices. Whatever my wife brings home. There you go. There you go. <laughs> All right. So um, homework assignment for y'all, and then uh, JD will introduce the topic for next month. Yeah. Um, so the homework assignment is: we want you to get your ministry team together, whatever that looks like. You know, could be one or two people. It could be you know an official team that's ten or fifteen people. Whatever it is. Get your team together and identify two areas you would like to see innovation take place and pick at least one practical step that you're going to take towards one of those two areas that you've identified. So we want you to do that and then come with questions, insights, ideas that you've learned from that process um, to discuss next month. And JD, then that leads us into our discussion. For next so our topic for next month, Lord willing, is the topic of leading your ministry team. And so uh, our title at this point is Leading Your Ministry Team in Kingdom Innovation, uh, Biblical Reflections on Tackling New Challenges in a Christ-like Manner. So as leaders, how, how do we how do we bring a team along in this process to to think about to set some of those um, innovation methods in place uh, where it becomes a healthy part of just the life uh, and routine of our, our team and uh, our scheduled time for next uh, session about a month from now is on July 23rd and uh, we'll be at the same time on July 23rd uh, eight o'clock mountain time nine o'clock central time, 10 o'clock Eastern standard time in the U S. So that's right. <laughs> John's in Northern time. I'm in central time, but most of the country does everything based on Eastern time. Eastern. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, uh, as, uh, I've said last time, the video will be on kingdom innovation.info, uh, or you'll be able to link to it from innovation and .com as well. Uh, but the video for this session will be on. So one of the things we encourage you to do, is um is take this video if it's been helpful to you especially the discussion part between jd and i but maybe even the whole thing with the questions and everything and use it as a discussion starter with your team mm -hmm. so play the video with your team um then begin to say okay so what do we do you know you know what do we think about these ideas and how what would it look like in our setting so um i would encourage you to do that so let me just wrap up in prayer and then okay. we'll be done dear god we want to pray that you bless each of the people on this call encourage their hearts today Give them opportunities to be innovative and strategic in their work and help them to do it all in dependence on you. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you, folks. Have a great day, everybody. God bless. Thanks.